while you've been sitting here and reading. <laughs> so I don't have to tell you who our speaker is or what the topic is uh, or even where it comes from. <laughs> That's all up there. And you now know that he's Director of Graduate Studies, which is probably not relevant because none of you are planning to uh, apply to uh, graduate studies in Ohio State. You may be applying for a job there, so you do want to pay very close attention. <laughs> we have some of our candidates in right now. Uh, yes, we just had uh, we just had one um, in for the organizational communication position, and a second USC student is coming in. Right. So pay very close attention. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yes. And a lot of applause and smart questions. Get right. to the end. So I'll turn it over to the last. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me out here today. Um, I have enjoyed my trip very much so far. I had a nice uh, tour of the campus this morning. It is gorgeous. Um, and I was excited to see the uh, dueling uh, Lucas and Spielberg buildings. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the complexities of the link, uh, political community diet. Um, and basically the idea here is to talk about how some different, the use of different types of political media outlets, the relationships between them, uh, ones that seemingly wouldn't kind of work together, that actually were finding some relationships. Um, and th these relationships, I think, are quite important. Um, and so I'm going to outline today basically three studies um, that kind of speak to this. But actually, before that, I want to talk about something that's kind of more of the spirit of these works um, that we have. And the spirit deals more with these kind of current debate we have about the future of political media effects. So in terms of talking about the political media environment, um, we have all these things going on. We have the changing media environment. We have selective exposure, possible rise of partisan echo chambers, that Republicans are only going to Republican outlets, liberals are only going to liberal outlets. A whole bunch of people that don't have any care about politics at all can simply forego any consumption of any news or any political material whatsoever. Um, we have the boundaries of what counts as political media, so much of discussion about that, which is news and entertainment, and the shows that I'll talk about a little bit today, like The Daily Show or The Colbert Report, do they even count as politics or not? Um, and if so, what type of influence are they having? Um, also, what is even deemed to be an effect? Um, and so, really it is, I, I, what I want to kind of stress today is that the field of political communication itself is kind of in a bit of turmoil at the moment. And it's really as a result of this changing media environment. Um, and it's causing us to kind of work, look, look inward as well as outward in terms of how should we begin to focus or begin to look at the role of media within the context of basic democratic processes. So really, in talking about this, I think that we're at kind of a theoretical crossroads. And much of the debate that you're seeing played out in the journals, in the peer-reviewed journals, about how we should look at political media, where are the boundaries, um, what are the nature of the influences or the lack thereof, or what have you, um, I think there's kind of, like we're missing the force through the truth, I think is by and large what I want to stress here today. And so we need to place the current discussion in the context of some core explanatory principles. And these core explanatory principles, that which kind of undergirds the, you know, addressing of why. Why are we doing this? Why are you turning out to The Daily Show? Why are you consuming the Colbert Report? Why are you turning to Fox News or MSNBC or CNN or any of these other particular outlets? Um, you know, that which makes something a theory and not just a model. Um, and so these, these core kind of explanatory principles, I think, are playing themselves out in this broader debate of how we look at the role of political media. And so there's three I'm going to talk about today. And one of my uh, former colleagues at the University of Delaware has highlighted these three as kind of being foundations for the study of not just political communication, but all of communication. All right, that these core explanatory principles in terms of core human activity that we as human beings seek out understanding, all right, we seek out consistency, all right, and we work under a basic kind of hedonic principle. We go toward that which is pleasure as well as running from that which is painful. All right, and so what I want to talk about is relative to the ongoing debates that we're having about very specific issues within the study of political communication, and specifically the role of media within political communication, all come back to basically 
an overarching discussion about the particular roles we have of these explanatory principles. Understanding, consistency, and basic kind of a Haddad principle. All right? And so the first two I'm going to talk about is understanding versus consistency. And I will make an argument that basically in the post kind of Lazarsfeld era has been dominated kind of by an understanding approach to, to that which is political media influence. All right? That we're seeking that political media seeks to provide understanding and we as audience members, the do dominant lens that we've had relative to the study of the mass media audience relative to the consumption of political material is about understanding. All right, and so what I'm arguing is that in terms of looking at understanding versus consistency, I think what we may be witnessing is the rise of a new kind of dominant explanatory principle, and that which is consistency. All right, so when we talk about the rise of partisan echo chambers, when we talk about Ben and Iyengar talking about the reduction of media influence, that everything is about reinforcement, that liberals are only concerning that which is liberal content. Conservatives are only concerning that which will represent their pre-existing worldviews and their ideologies as well. All right, that they're seeking out consistency. All right, and that that is going to be the new kind of dominant theoretical lens by which we look at political media influence. So in terms of looking at this post lazarsfeld age and being about understanding, I'll highlight here just agenda setting as kind of a dominant theory. So kind of the dominant theory and all the content analyses, all the navel gazing that we do as a field of communication relative to what are the dominant theories that are out there, what are the dominant approaches that we got. In terms of the area of political communication, quite clearly agenda setting has been the dominant theory um, within the study of politics. And so it is the dominant theory within political communication theory for the post Lazarsfeld era in Pavit. In, in particular, singles out agenda setting as a classic kind of understanding based theory. So, in outlining these explanatory principles and where they play out in regard to a whole bunch of different subfields within communication, um, in highlighting understanding, he, highlight, he, he notes agenda setting as being an understanding based theory. And in particular, are we other? he highlights the need for orientation. So, on the audience side, a key moderator variable within agenda setting is the need for orientation. The idea, am I motivated in, in terms of cons consuming pop political content, as well as maybe particular issues, as well as do I have a heightened level of uncertainty about that? So if indeed my motivation is high and my perceived ability is fairly low, I will seek out more political media content, and that serves as kind of a key moderator of any agenda setting of the <coughs> media ceilings to audience ceilings transfer. All right, so on the audience side, he talks about the need for orientation is really nothing more than a need for understanding. I have uncertainty about this, I'm motivated about it, but I need to know more, I turn to media for it, and I'm seeking out understanding. And so the creation of kind of key audience <coughs> variables within an agenda setting framework has been built around understanding. And I'll actually argue also on the message generation side. So Katz long ago, um, um, is we <coughs> talked about that in summarizing relative to key criticisms of Lazarsfeld's approach. All right, so Lazarsfeld's approach was much more around marketing and around persuasion. So looking at political media influence, that political media campaigns were by and large there as a persuasive act, as a marketing effort. All right, and so there's a bunch of paradigms that Katz raised in terms of key criticism. So he talks about the technological paradigm, so like McLuhan's work. He talks about a critical paradigm in terms of like uh, Gitlin's criticisms of Lazarsfeld's approach. As well as then he highlights on the empirical side this what he defined as an institutional paradigm. And the institutional paradigm is still being grounded within kind of quantitative empirical approaches was the least radical. Um, but he basically says this, that uh, that it, Lazarsfeld's approach, mistakenly treats the media as agents of persuasion rather than as providers of information. Right? That this key kind of criticism of the Lazarsfeld approach about being about marketing and persuasion was that it's missing the boat that actually news media there is by, is by and large used in terms of providing information. Right, and so, and Katz actually mentions agenda setting as well as the best known case or representation of the institutional paradigm. Right, and so Max McCombs and others, in terms Max, in terms of creating agenda setting, I mean, I just completed a book with Max, and 
the discussions that we have, clearly his modus operandi, the assumption he makes is that news is there to provide information. All right, in terms of its key role within democracy is that him as former journalist and kind of having that mindset of what journalism is there for is there to provide information to aid citizens to be better citizens in terms of aiding the democratic process. All right, so both on the message creation side as well as the audience side, Theories like agenda setting that have kind of dominated in the post Lazarus Feld era up until very recently and have been of recent the most often criticized for very specific reasons, but I think the more overarching reason is that agenda setting is kind of a reflection of this kind of approach to political media as understanding, as a dominant kind of theoretical lens. All right? And so now, I don't want to say in this kind of the last three or four decades or so that there hasn't been consistency. All right? I'm just saying that understanding has been kind of a dominant way of explanatory principle, but consistency has also been in the mix of looking at political communication media effects. And so consistency <coughs> itself um, has been around, and if you look at studies just like talk radio studies, so studying Limbaugh or any of those others, Barker, as well as Lee and Capella, as well as Hofstetter, a whole bunch of others, a whole bunch of political communication in terms of conservative political talk radio studies, clearly are looking from the standpoint of consistency. <coughs> the idea that they are, those who are gravitating toward these outlets are those that are, are have preconditioned in terms of being politically very conservative and that the, these particular outlets are serving to reinforce or strengthen their particular positions that they already have. Right? And so it's not that consistency wasn't around at all. It clearly was. All right? But it's a matter of which one is dominant. So the shifting dominance toward consistency. So if you look at uh, many of the arguments that Ben and I Engart were talking about in their um, JOC, recent JOC pieces of talking about the end of political communication media facts, they were talking by and large about the idea that everybody will gravitate toward everything that they have a that represents their pre-existing worldviews. And not only that, they will run away from all right, that which is counter-attitudinal. Right? And it will create this kind of reinforcement effect and highly skewed toward this kind of consistency framework. Or Jameson Capella talking about the rise, rise of partisan echo chambers. Very similar. The idea of having a clear lens that, as a result of the new media environment, expanded <coughs> range of outlets a disaggregation of the mass audience, of uh, being able to highlight very specific pieces of content that directly reflect your existing worldviews and serving just to reinforce those in some way. All right? They will create these very heightened kind of parse echo chambers. You're only talking to other people that are exactly like you, and there's an inability to kind of bridge all right? and to be civil with one another and all these potential downsides. Now, might it be that our theorizing is seeking to replace understanding with consistency as being at the forefront of how we approach political media influence? And where this really came up was at the last ICA meeting at Singapore, in that seeing all of the presentations, especially from those out of Annenberg East about the 2008 data, we were really seeing fervent, fervent belief in consistency. All right, um, especially out of the graduate students. So you could clearly see that this was a dominant lens that they were looking at in terms of the nature of these consistency effects. And I'm not arguing they're not there by any means. All right, what I think though um, I'm looking for is some need for diversification. Um, and this is what I've been really talking to Charlie Tavlin about quite a bit. In looking at these explanatory principles, it isn't enough in terms of theory building just to highlight where do these explanatory principles exist, but we need to make a recommendation that any field that we study, and any area of study of communication itself, I think would be well served of looking at diversity, diversity of explanatory principles. And so the last thing we want to do as a field is discard one dominant explanatory principle, perhaps one that was overused. Maybe understanding was too dominant, all right? And then replace it with some other dominant lens of something like consistency. It's kind of like in the study of um, you know, Supreme Court cases. So law schools will talk about the ping pong ball effect. You know, in terms of the basic human endeavor, that in terms of if there's an initial Supreme Court decision on one, on one issue, it's usually at one extreme. 
then the immediate next decision that exists within the Supreme Court is usually the other extreme. And then subsequent Supreme Court cases get you back to the middle somewhere. Right? I'm, I'm thinking to some degree, or at least what I feel I'm witnessing, is something like a ping pong ball effect. All right? That we're over here at understanding. All right? The next wave that I see kind of on the horizon here is a lot of consistency. All right? And what I'm arguing for is that we need to be somewhere more in the middle, some type of balance. All right, in terms of that reflection of that kind of diversification of these explanatory principles. And so I think that's when we take a little bit more of a measured approach in what we are offering as a retort relative to many of the points that Ben and Angar were raising about the future of political media effects. We were acknowledging that clearly consistency is playing a role, that people are gravitating toward that which is a reflection of their pre-existing worldviews. No question. And there's clear empirical data for that. All right. But what I'm also, I think we're also, we're also arguing is that there's particular conditions, particular contexts of which we still seek out understanding. We seek out a diversity of, of range of outlets, a diversity of information on the political topics that are of interest to us. All right. So we're trying to take a more measured approach. All right. So we need to focus on making sure the field employs some diversified set of explanatory principles. All right. And that goes for the hedonic principle as well, which I'm going to get to here in a moment. So it's not just about understanding consistency, but it's also the idea of looking at political media content potentially as pleasure. All right? And as pleasure, not only pleasurable, but the nature of the pleasure you receive from particular media outlets may allow certain associations between outlets to rise up in some way. All right, so in, this is kind of the thrust. This is kind of the... Um, the overall arching picture, I think, in terms of the what I want to offer here today. So there's three studies, I mean elements of studies. I'm not going to go through all five, I know it's much time. Um, and so in terms of these three studies, we have one that we have just finished up that is looking at the relationship between ideology, MSNBC viewing, Fox News viewing, and looking at ideology as a suppressor period. All right, so looking at that kind of core relationship of ideology relative to these very kind of different ideologically oriented political media outlets. We have another piece in here that's in press and communication monographs, which what I'm going to really highlight today is this new um, measure we've created of an affinity for political humor. You're really trying to understand what's the nature of the audience for people that are consuming the Daily Show and the Colbert Report. Besides, it's younger, and we know that. All right, beyond that, what else? All right, we didn't know much else before that. Um, and then we have another piece coming out here um, in American Behavioral Scientist that's looking at satire, and particularly looking at differential effects of what are defined as juvenilian versus Horatian satire. All right, so not looking at satire as monolithic. All right, and this is where I will mention, um, we started to work with actually professional comedy writers and creating unique stimuli uh, that we can manipulate um, to be able to look at these satire effects in particular, to understand that we as communication scholars, what we can do is provide an understanding of the message or in a more nuanced perspective or understanding of the message itself. And this is what we can add to the mix here. All right, so there's just some elements of these that I'll be talking about. So first, looking at this kind of core issue of understanding versus consistency. All right, at the core, I think, would be these three. All right, so the triumvirate here rests, I believe, at the nexus of the relationship between understanding and consistency. This relationship between MSNBC viewing as liberal outlet. Fox News viewing as more of a conservative outlet, and then your political ideology, right? that which is leading you to gravitate toward or away from these particular outlets. All right, so on the consistency side, you have ideology. So if you have conservative coded high, which we do for this particular study, it will positively predict Fox News. The more conservative you are, you're going to consume Fox News. The more liberal you are, negatively coded, right, the more consumption of MSNBC viewing. All right, so there's consistency there. Your ideology that you're going to be positively influencing this one outlet, and at the other end of the political spectrum, it'll be negatively influencing. As well as then, you have understanding, condi conditions under which people seek out counter attitudinal political media. This is actually a lot of the work of uh, one of my colleagues, Kelly Garrett. All right, so the idea that if you are forewarned that you are going to come into contact with somebody who doesn't have the same political ideology as you, you may want to consume the other side to get a sense of what they're talking about in some way. All right? Or, also another condition is that you are exceedingly at peace with your political ideologies, that you don't have any anxiety, that you feel very comfortable in your beliefs, and that you can step into that counter-attitudinal world and not feel that, uh, I could be 
influence in some way I don't desire. Right? That there are times when you'll actually seek out understanding of the other side in some way, right? which will allow for somewhat of a positive connection to actually exist between these seemingly disparate outlets. And then also, we, we actually know this from Nielsen data. So Webster, who does a lot of work in terms of using Nielsen data, has actually found that Fox News viewers, those that are defined as kind of heavy Fox News viewers, actually there is a moderate level of use of like MSNBC viewing, as well as CNN, as well as general uh, broadcast news, and all those types of good things. It's not like the Fox News viewers are just consuming 24-7 of Fox, and then that's it. All right, is that they're consuming actually a quite a wide range of particular types of content itself. So in terms of looking at this kind of mix of consistency and understanding, you have a potential state of imbalance. So if you think in like Hyderian terms, in terms of the basic states of balance and imbalance. So if we have ideology which negatively predicts variable B and positively predicts variable C, there should be a negative relationship between those. But here, we're actually arguing, and we actually know from Nielsen data that it's actually slightly positive. All right? And so as a result of this state of imbalance, um, we would expect ideology to be, have significant but opposing influence on the respective types of political media outlets. But we would also expect there to be a positive, small, but positive relationship between MSNBC viewing and Fox News viewing. Right? That under those conditions of understanding that certain people out there consume both. And there will be some moderate level of, understand, uh, of seeking out understanding, and as a result, there will be a positive relationship. Because when you boil it on, all down, they're both about politics. Right? As a result, they have a natural connection with one another. So what this is actually a great, this is, we don't do this very well as a field of communication, is that there are cases of suppression. When we look at so we know third variables of like moderators and mediators and moderated mediation and mediated moderation and all those wonderful things of looking at processes of influence. But one thing we don't study very well in communication, and at least we don't posit, we don't hypothesize about suppression. We oftentimes find suppression as it's a great like post hoc finding. Like you always see that, I was like, oh, there's a suppressor effect. Then I was like, isn't that neat? That, wow, I didn't know that that exists. And that's all that we see it as. Right? But in these states of imbalance, like the one I've just described in the relationship between ideology, MSNBC, and Fox, is the key place where you would be able to actually predict suppression. All right? And so the role of ideology as potential suppressor, what I mean by suppressor is that the relationship between Fox News and MSNBC is at a certain threshold, a certain positive but small relationship. If you extract out the variance in MSNBC viewing and Fox News viewing that is due to ideology, that which serves to separate it, that relationship will actually rise. So as suppressor, it is ideology is suppressing the relationship between Fox and MSNBC viewing. So that when you introduce it into the mix, what you're going to see is that beta weight that, or that correlation actually rise up, become much stronger. All right, and what you'll be able to do is you're extracting the consistency element and seeing what else is there. All right, and we can actually posit that under the state of kind of imbalance. All right, so the method we have here is that this was an initial phone survey. We're actually doing this a second time with a much larger survey. This was um, kind of a pilot test uh, to see what was going on. Um, of Ohio residents, Jan uh, December 2009, January 2010, we did a single frame design. And a single frame design is cellular and landline separate strata. In the sense that we're, we're studying entertainment media and we want to get the younger folks in there. If I just do the landline, it would be like zero, you know, people consuming that. All right? So we've got to get the cellular phones in there. Um, and you'll actually see we did this initial one with 300. We wanted to keep it equal because I wanted to do some methodological things relative to it, but you'll see the difference. It's almost 17 years, all right, in terms of average age, all right, in the, the graying of the landline. So this particular method, in terms of just using landlines the old way, it's like, whoo, you're missing a lot. All right, and the response rates we wanted to keep relatively equal. All right, so we're only looking at 300 people here in, in Ohio. It was basically just the idea of cellular and, and landline phone to just get out there and just make phone calls and see who we can get. All right, uh, I don't care which, which way you go. All right. 
terms of the analyses, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide you with three structural equation models and examine the correlation between Fox News and MSNBC. That's really all that matters. All right? So there's going to be initial CFA. We're going to have a latent variable for Fox News, which we have separate measures of Hannity, Beck, O'Reilly. We have a latent variable for MSNBC viewing, so we have measures of Maddow, Olbermann, and Matthews. All right? So when we get that baseline, what's the baseline relationship between those two? Then what we want to do is introduce a bunch of exogenous controls. Your political involvement, your use of traditional political media, um, newspaper, daily newspapers, broadcast television news, any and all of those things, as well as basic demographics. All right? So introduce those exogenous controls. What happens to that correlation? And then we want to look at the correlation once we introduce ideology as another predictor. All right? And basically what we want to see is that initial positive relationship rise up. Once we're able to extract the variance that serves that which serves to suppress the relationship between those two, that, that correlation is actually going to rise up. All right. So what we have here is basically that little puppy right there is what matters. All right, and so what we have here in terms of looking at Fox News and MSNBC, once again with the three variables for each, is that we have an initial, as we would hypothesize, and it's basically kind of a reflection of the Nielsen data. The Fox MSNBC relationship is at 0.11, not statistically significant. It's positive, it's there, but not really meaningful relative to zero. All right, and so if we look at that relationship, then we introduce a whole series of exogenous controls. So we have seven exogenous predictor variables. Once again, that Lance, is. Could you go back just for a second? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. What's the measure of Fox News separate from those? Oh, uh, Fox News is just a latent construct. So it's just serving as, as, as a thing there, kind of like a factor, mm -hmm. um, as a factor relative to these and as right. well. So it's all combined out of those. Exactly, exactly. But it, it's not just purely additive. It is still treated as latent constructs. So this is actually taking into account the measurement error as well. And the measurement error, I mean, the alphas for these were both about 0.85 or 0.87, fairly high. So it's not extracting too much variance uh, from there, but it, it does exist. All right, and so looking then, basically all we did is then take seven exogenous predictors and predict these each of these, on each of these, all right, and to see what goes on. And what we find is that basically the relationship exactly holds. If you take into account your political interest, you take into account broadcast television news use, newspaper use, your age, your biological sex, your um, education levels, all that stuff, the relationship doesn't change. It's still a 0.11 non-significant, but it's positive and it's still there. Right? <coughs> then all we did on the third model is simply introduce ideology as another predictor. That's all it is. All right? And so we add ideology as an eighth predictor. All right, and then you see that ideology has a significant predictive of Fox News, 0.36, and MSNBC of negative 0.32. It works in opposite directions, as we would think. And actually, the correlation moves up to 0.25. All right, suppression. We've extracted that which distinguishes MSNBC from Fox. We've taken out the consistency element. And what's left is understanding, I would argue. We have to parse that out a little bit. All right, maybe other things as well. All right, but indeed, there is a much stronger correlation that exists there. All right, and so when we take out all those other predictors and we just look at the core triumvirate, all right, that exists here, you have a state of imbalance. You have ideology serving as a negative predictor of MSNBC, or conservative code mm -hmm. You have a positive correlation here, and this is also positive. All right, if it was balanced scenario, this would be negative. They would be all right, working in an opposite direction of one another. All right, where actually what is there is that it's a reflection. They're both about politics. All right, and there are particular conditions, with particular people. All right, if we study this further, certain conditions under which that will even grow in strength. All right, so it's not that we're running away from that which is counter attitudinal all the time. That's the key discussion about selective exposure at the moment. It's the same argument. It's not like we're offering anything new. This is the same argument that Chafee made of his problems with selective exposure. Do people gravitate toward that which is in line with their existing political views? Of course. The latter half of selective exposure, and a lot of this discussion, though, is that you run away from that which is counter-attitudinal. All right? And what Chafee argued long ago is that that's simply not the case. 
and there isn't really much empirical evidence that points to that. And we have a fair bit of, political, of empirical evidence that actually says, no, you actually also seek out that which runs counter attitudinal. And it's like the old, like, and there's no laws of communication, but if there was one, it's like communication breeds more communication. You consume more politics, you will consume more political communication. All right, so communication breeds more communication. So the idea of that there are some positive, fairly strong associations between these kind of disparate types of outlets. All right. All right. So the closing point out of these is that the triad of relationships that are focused on the study are the squarely at the crossroads of the principles of understanding. I would argue that Fox News MSNBC correlation, although we've got to really figure out what's creating that. All right. I think is a solid reflection of understanding as well as of consistency of the role of ideology as predictor of each of the two. And if you look at that, that combination of consistency and understanding, the, the, the mix of the two, you get some very odd relationships. All right, that we are complex beings. All right, yes? Do you look at any other um, mediator, moderator, um, that would be relevant, such as need for cognition? Oh, I uh, yes, I understand. Um, no, actually, I would say that what we're doing in the larger study, it's a very good point, um, something like need for cognition, actually, I would actually argue need for closure. And the idea of like closed-mindedness as one dimension of need for closure would be, I, I think, even a more important one. Because obviously, I, we, you have some more say, but this almost seems like a dual processing model. That in how? In so, the, you have, depending on whether you meet X, Y, Z conditions, if you're, you take the, uh, your, your central route would be going for information, your peripheral route would be going for consistency. Right, right. So I think, exactly, I, I think And that really takes the idea of persuasion to information, so. Right, right. So the idea here of like, we introduced something like political involvement, so that dealt with the motivation issue, mm -hmm. and that's in here in the mix. Mm -hmm. All right, and I think the other one, the key one that you raised actually is also ability. So actually something as ability as operationalized as political knowledge. Mm -hmm. All right, and then how do we operationalize political knowledge and put that in the mix of not just basic kind of, do you know who the vice president yeah. is and all those things, of looking at it in a much broader way, I think is important. And that's actually something that we're talking about now relative to the next survey going out, of looking really at the ability side. But I'm a big like motivation ability guy. Mm -hmm. And I believe those are kind of the two key concepts here. And so we've dealt, I think, with the motivation side, but not with the ability side. And actually, relative to the Fox, MSNBC, and especially relative to the Daily Show, um, as what we're going to talk about, it's like ability is a big deal. All right, because if you look at the survey data, what's the most knowledgeable group out there? If you could isolate in terms of a particular media outlet, where's the political knowledge the highest? Daily yeah. Show. The Daily Show. Why? So you can get the jokes. You can get the jokes. There's no gratifications obtained if you don't have the political <coughs> knowledge. Right? As well as there's differences in terms of like the Fox News um, audience has generally been found to be the lowest in terms of political knowledge. So there's an ability level going on here somewhere. I think that's kind of the key point. Um, and so we need to place a set of relationships in a broader debate about the future of media effects research and how best to approach our use of the dominant explanatory principles. And I would argue that any of the relationships we're going to look at is a combination of them in some way. And how if one become dominant over the other and simply looking from that one lens is not going to aid us all that much. So we need some mix of them in some way. All right. So then looking at this in terms of addition, adding in then political entertainment media in the mix, and now we get it even more complex. Um, so we know very little about who is consuming political entertainment based media, the Daily Show, the Colbert Report. All right? The treatment of humor is monolithic. All right? There's just a whole bunch of studies like humor does this persuasive wise. Oh my god, there's a lot of types. There's there's irony, there's satire, there's there's sarcasm, they're all doing different things. All right? And as, as well as the treatment of satire is monolithic, which I, that's where I've started to really kind of take a look. All right, so the idea here, and what I'm going to talk about, once again, is returning to kind of literary criticism, that there are many different types of satire out there that exist, and they have very differential effect. So the low variance accounted for, since I'm quantitative and empirical, I like variance. Um, and so Young and Tissinger, um, that was the best that we had. We had 14%. They did great work. Dan is one of my favorite people, and so is Russ. Actually, um, and so 14% of the Daily Show consumption is what they've been able to predict. We got a little ways to go, and me as you know, as 
the empirical scholar, I like to go where the bar has been set pretty low. So 14% is a pretty good place for me to go to find something to get higher, right? Um, and so we need to know more about who's consuming political satire program and what other political media behaviors are linked to the consumption of this type of, of, of activity, right? In order to be able to understand the nature of that audience a little bit. Right. So there's three problems with extant research in this area. One is that the dependent variables introduce confounds. So if you look at like the Annenberg data or you even look at the Michigan data, they, the large national surveys out there, they'll ask you, did you watch The Daily Show, Jay Leno, David Leverett, all in one? Well, The Daily Show, The Colbert Report, you know you're getting politics when you turn to it. All right, Leno and Letterman and those, yes, you get some politics, but it's about pop culture. It's about entertainment by and large. All right, and what people gravitate to, those are very different things. All right, and they confound one another. All right, and so if you mix them all together, I would argue, and so I created this typology of political entertainment on television, that once you start mixing those together in measures, your variance is gonna drop, all right? Because people are doing different for different reasons. Utilize only those IVs commonly employed in predicting news use. So you say, all right, that predicted news, let's see if it does the Daily Show. Let's see if it does the Colbert Report, or whatever else. No, I ain't gonna get us too far. It's not news, it's different. Um, failure to explicate and operationalize specific measures for the task at hand. All right, and this is what I really want to mention, is the idea that this, this is, we're moving along far enough in this area of research that we need to actually start creating our own variables in some way. And so the one that we created uh, for this, for the communication monographs piece <coughs> is an affinity for political humor. So affinity for political humor is seen as a kind of a higher order factor relative to a lower order factors of incongruity. Incongruity is that, um, in a humorous way, you like political humor because it presents kind of uh, the disconnect between our political values and political behaviors, that our actions don't match with what our values, and it can be done so in a humorous way, all right, and you get utility out of that. Um, superiority, the idea of the inside joke, or making, you know, belittling the opposite side in some way, and political humor can provide you with utility, making you feel superior. Uh, anxiety relief, that you know you're going to be talking about politics at a certain dinner party, um, and so you use, like, oh, this is what Stuart said about me about uh, Bush, or this is what Stuart had to say about Obama, and it's an easy way to transition into discussion of politics and reduce your anxiety about that for your social situation, as well as social cohesion. So some of like social cohesion can be like a social capital. So the idea that there's bridging social capital and bonding social capital. Bonding in terms of bringing together those that are like-minded all the more through humor, as well as serving as a bridge to connect those that are have opposing political views with you. You can use humor as a means of like, oh, they're all jokers anyway, all right? Or they're all out to get us anyway, or whatever, they're all about power and they're not about us, or whatever, and we can meet, and you can present that humorous, in, in a humorous way, much more humorous than I just did. Um, all right, and so in terms of affinity for political humor, in, in breaking down then, we did a whole bunch of all entry regressions and what have you, but when you, boil, when you get on the brass tacks, when the rubber meets the road, what, what predicts political satire? In the forward step rise regression, we have four variables. Four variables, once again, 14% is my, my threshold. If I get higher than that, I can prove something. All right, and so I have four variables that account for 45%. All right, and so this is what it comes down to, age, yes, younger, we knew that already. All right, we have MSNBC viewing is actually the largest predictor, all right, of the consumption of political satire. And once again, political satire is operationalized as your use of The Daily Show and The Colbert Report. Those two, all right, almost. We have satirical situation comedies, The Simpsons, Family Guy, all right, as, as well as well as our affinity for political humor scale, all right. That looking, but what's not in that mix? What's that? Socioeconomics. Oh, yes. All right. So all the basic demographics do very little beyond age and political ideology. And at the zero order, political ideology and party ID are virtually at zero. All right. So you know, once again, this idea of this balance. All right, you know ideology is connected, once again, this is the same data says what I had before. All right, um, is that the MSNBC viewing and the connection to ideology is strong. That is it Simpsons and Family Guy, I would imagine. Right, oh, definitely. And it's excluding certain conservative values, conservative audiences. Certainly, <clears throat> certainly. And so you have here, ideology is connected to MSNBC, but idea, and, and MSNBC is strongly connected with The Daily Show and The Colbert Report, but ideology is not doing anything relative to political entertainment media, all right, at all. And so as a result, um, the political satire MSNBC connection, once again, we don't know, quite know this, but we're trying to think of how, why is there, there's this connection? 
And so political ideology and party ID have little predictive value here. All right, but we have a very strong connection between the two types of political media use. Political satire, traditional political satire, and MSNBC. Well, perhaps it has much to do with the nature by which politics is being presented relative to actual political meanings being lost. All right, in the sense of, if you look at Matthews, Olerman, and Maddow, they all employ comedic elements. A lot. Actually, Maddow creates specific guests to come on and provide a comedic presentation of politics. The worst persons of the world on Olbermann, or whatever else it may be. There's an element of comedy. There's an element of humor in there in some way. All right? Could that be the nature of the connection? If it's not ideology, all right, that's serving as a predictor of one with the other, then is it some more kind of hedonic principle? The idea that this is pleasurable, all right, that this is being presented or in a way that's actually humorous in some way. All right, and so this is what we've been starting to think about. If we start thinking about that, though, then we have to understand humor better. All right, and so in terms of looking at this last study, the first major step that needs to be taken is getting beyond humor as monolithic. There's many different types of humor that exist. All right, we decided to turn our attention to satire. All right, satire doesn't necessarily have to be humorous. The modus operandi of satire is to present human weakness, human folly. All right, that can be done in a humorous or a non-humorous way, but our most kind of important or the most well-known sat satirical outlets definitely use humor. All right, whether it be The Onion or The Daily Show, Colbert Report, or whatever, there's a clear humor element that exists there. And particularly, we're going to look at Horatian versus Juvenalian satire. Now, this is a long history in literary criticism. All right, so when we look at Horatian versus Juvenalian, Horatian is kind of like light and witty satire, kind of like a dry, Wry smile, kind of producing, like, huh, yeah, or whatever. Right? And, uh, versus juvenilian is much more acidic, much more biting, all right, that exists out there. So Horatian, oftentimes like Doomsbury, is presented as kind of Horatian satire. Michael Moore, or what have you, is presented as more juvenilian, more acidic in terms of tone. All right, and so these are very well, there's actually other types of satire. There's Menopean satire, there's a whole bunch of others that exist out there uh, in some way. And I don't even know if I said Menopean right, but I uh, yeah. That's I'm going with. Um, I don't even know if I'm saying those right. Um, Use of professional comedy writers to craft the original pieces of satire. Um, I started to reach out to the comedy writers during the writer's strike, because um, I figured they weren't doing anything. Uh, and so the idea here was the idea, and it was wonderful. They've actually gotten really engaged with it, because they're like, oh yeah, that's what I was doing. I didn't know. I didn't know there were differences. Right? And they're seeing the bigger picture uh, that exists here. Um, so we, we trained them in terms of providing them with material about this is what Horatian, this is what Juvenilian is. We go and have them craft basically op-eds. So we're working just at the text phase relative to the creation of these pieces of satire, the representation of the Horatian versus Juvenilian. And really in the sense of it allows me to create more precise message manipulations, all right, that are a reflection of these different types of satire and what they're doing. All right, and so we go through an extensive amount of pretesting to try to be able to get ascertain that they are equal on and a whole bunch of other things, as well as still being distinct on what are the core distinctions between Horatian and Juvenilian. All right, and basically we're taking a persuasion focus here. So you brought up the yellow before of motivation and ability. All right, so thank you. Uh, I'll pay you later for. for um, and so using kind of basically the, uh, the, 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 the key concepts here of motivation and ability, uh, looking into the persuasive influence of these different types of satire. So in terms of the design, we do a basic kind of three-message juvenile inspiration versus traditional. The traditional one was um, just some traditional op-ed that was out there on the same topic, all right, that we cut down in terms of word length and all that types in terms of type token ratio in terms of less, uh, less kind of diversity and sentence diversity and all those types of things, keeping them all equal. And then an ability manipulation of high and low. Now, the ability manipulation is different from the ELM. In terms of ability, if we think about the communication inputs, ability of uh, recipients relative to context. By and large, even though they're talking about ability as, as a recipient characteristic, they basically manipulate context. They'll create some you know, distraction or something in the room that you can't have the ability to attend to the message as well. But in political communication, what we really care about is actually your knowledge, your ability. All right? So we wanted to manipulate that. Um, so study one is 169 people. Study two is 185. Um, we utilize only those, what I want to do is highlight only those with high motivation. I want to see what those people, those that are going to engage with the political material and see what they do. So we're going to highlight only those, and we got it down to the 169 and 185. And then 
The two topics in terms of ability manipulations, what we're doing is Hillary Clinton's health care plan we did around January, February of 2008. And we did the ownership of change. There's a change election, right? So Obama's talking about change, and McCain's talking about change, and bringing back his maverick status, and all that wonderful stuff. So who owned change? And does the election going to create any change at all anyway? All right, and we did that right in October 2008. And in Columbus, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio is the tipping point of Ohio. And Ohio is the tipping point of the country, lowest deduction. So we have the four major players, presidents, vice presidents, in there on every day for the last month. All right, so in terms of interest and engagement, it's like very high in Columbus, Ohio. So in terms of the ability manipulations, what we'll do is actually provide from third party sources information for the high ability group about Hillary Clinton's health care plan. This is what it's going to do, this is how much it's going to cost. And we broke it down by different dimensions of health care, um, which has been help studying health care policy. And then on the low uh, information side, low ability side, we'll give basic kind of um, biographical information about Hillary Clinton as well as just basic information about health care. And then also here, like third party um, representations, will Obama, uh, with, with what Obama's presenting, what McCain is presenting, are they going to actually, do their policies reflect change or not? And offering a little bit of both sides. And on the other side, just providing basic biographical information and the idea that, um, the idea of change within elections writ large. The elections are a reflection of change. All right? um, and so basically what I do is a, a, a satire by ability interactions. And I'm only going to highlight two variables here. Perceived humor and counter argument. Basically the idea here is that we believe that the Horatian, the kind of more light witty, witty satire, will work better under a low ability condition. That when your ability's not all that high, and you're just like, all right, this is going to be in a way that, um, all right, this is dealing with in kind of a light, witty way. I'm going to find that humorous, and I'm not going to be able to counter argue as well as a result of the humor kind of rising through. And versus in the uh, high ability condition of like, I've got information. This is a serious topic. And if, if, if you're dealing with it in a light, kind of witty way, the Horatian side, I'm going to be really annoyed. All right, I'm not going to find it funny. I'm going to counter argue. And the juvenilian one, in terms of that acidic biting type of approach, is going to be much more in line with what is the nature of this issue and let's deal with it all right, in some way. All right, and so basically this is what we find. Um, so the perceived humor, in terms of the traditional op-ed, not funny. All right, and then the juvenilian Horatian. So in terms of juvenilian Horatian, you see a big difference from ability low to high, that the Horatian is seen as quite funny by the low ability. And it is actually the juvenilian that's seen as more funny in the high ability condition. And then also in terms of counter-arguing, low to high ability, what we find is that the Horatian, right, your, your ability to counter-argue is very low in low ability, but actually uh, quite high in the high ability condition. You just kind of just don't find it funny. And it's like, I'm going to counter-argue. This is stupid. All right? As well as the juvenilian, you see a slight decrease. Um, you're able to counter-argue fairly well in the low ability condition, and it actually drops in the high ability condition as a result. All right, so the perceived humor and the counter-arguing match. Um, I'm not showing um, the actual attitude effects because they're a little bit different between the two. I, I showed that much Rebel Kids. Um, uh, yeah. uh, and, and so, but really what you find, the big differences are actually in terms of actually a post-attitude persuasion. Um, the actual attitude effects is much more at the high ability. Um, that's where you see the difference. The juvenile and Horatian work about the same at the low ability condition, but at the high ability condition, that's where you see a real distinction. The juvenile is highly effective, all right? uh, much more so than even the traditional op-ed of being able to say, wow, yeah, Hillary Clinton's health care plan, not all that great. Wow, this election's not going to be all that much about change. All right? um, and also in terms of the Horatian being just terrible, not at all working under a high ability condition whatsoever. Yes? Based on ideology for this one? Oh, um, actually, in terms of if, if we went, now these were just randomly placed, so ideology kind of balances itself out. But if you went and you actually extracted, if you extracted, like as a covariate, the effects just become greater. Actually. All right, so you have perceived humor and counter argument. So this is basically the idea of politics as pleasure. You need to recognize that political media content can be pleasurable. Not seeing the same influence of ideology and party ID for relative to political entertainment media, though its role. All right, and not all humorous satirical messages have the same influences. They're very different. All right, I know I'm running long. Very sorry. Um, conclusion: The patterns of use formed between various political media outlets uh, reveal very complex kind of picture. 
right? A true understanding of political media influence will only come uh, with a sense of how the various outlets work in coordination with one another. And this is where the intertextuality that Dana Young and I have talked about here uh, in a recent piece. If you look at somebody like Oberman and O'Reilly, they're constantly referencing one another. All right? And so the only way you really understand that back and forth is consuming both. It'll naturally serve to gravitate. And how much does John Stewart, if you look at the entertainment, reference CNN, Fox, MSNBC? It'll naturally lead them to connecting with one another. All right? And so we need to embrace a broad range of explanatory principles, understanding consistency of the basic dialogue principle if we're going to gain any true understanding. So that gets back to my earlier point that this is kind of really a mix of them in some way. And if we get to a point where one of them tends to be dominant over the others, then I don't think that's all that great. Um, I think the idea that we need to have some mix of these in some way of getting at the core question of why, um, be able to understand the role of media within politics. All right. Thank you. Your last point. Yeah. I would suggest something. When Stewart talks about what he does, disingenuous or not, he claims that what he's talking about is media, not politics. Right. Where you saw his interview with, Matt. with, with Rachel Maddow. Yes. I mean, his response to some of this, which, which goes to your intertextuality point, as well as to the motivation for watching so you get the joke, right. goes back and forth. Because what he claims is that he's really a media critic, right. not a political right. critic. And he's criticizing, what I have to say, Fox more than MSNBC, right. although he right. claims to do both. So the two are kind of wrapped around each other. I think, I mean, The Daily Show works at, I think, multiple levels, because if you look at satire, they define in literary criticism that satire is pre-generic, that it builds off a pre-existing genre. And so The Daily Show itself works off the genre of the nightly news. So therefore, it is a satirical representation of it. And, but then the, also, oh, the other thing I found very interesting, and this is actually part of really talking with the comedy writers, is to understand one thing he raises in the Maddow interview that I thought was very insightful is the idea of like, I'm not in the game, right? That I have boundaries, right? Or whatever else it may be. But it is what they talk about in, in uh, the lit crit side is that every satirist ends up being that which he or she satirized originally. And this is what he's fighting. The idea of maintaining some distance, some role, some boundary. And if you break it, you become that which you were satirizing. I mean, I think he's. He, 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 I think he's, he's not persuasive. Yeah, yes. I, I think he's, he's. He's not persuasive. Right. right. I think Maddow is, gets. You know, right. Gets the best of that argument. Right. 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 Argument about about what he's. But I, I think that's why one thing is what I'm, I'm actually thinking about. I was just texting on the playwright out here. Actually, a couple of my graduate students. Well, not during the flight. <laughs> um, and the other um, was the idea of looking normatively at sat as satirists. The idea that satirists supposedly, uh, if you do it right, there are constraints that you work under, just like journalists do. And as a result, you get a sense of do you do it right or not. And you can study it normatively. And the idea of creating some kind of normative theory relative to satire and getting in there and talking to the writers about the nature of, are they aware of this? And is the nature of the process? And, and, and what are the boundaries that they feel they work under or not? I think is are exceedingly important questions that we haven't we haven't jumped to that side. There's also the gotcha phenomenon, where it seems to be part of this watching each other that you that you pick up. Because when I've looked at comments on you know on websites or blogs, you know particularly ones that are you know fairly clearly on you know one side of that spectrum or another, it seems to me that a lot of the people who are reading and commenting are clearly disagreeing. I mean, they're clearly on the other. And there's a sense that they're monitoring the other side to catch them in some way. Uh, see, yeah, and, and that's the other part of, of what is the nature of the understanding? Like, are you seeking out to, to try and get somebody or, or to, yeah. to, to, to show their weaknesses? And I completely agree that that needs to be part of the process. Yeah, I mean, so what are the driving mechanisms creating those connections? Yeah, because it's not exactly understanding in the, in the traditional sense, sense exactly. if what they're doing is, is, right. is looking for it either to monitor it because it's dangerous and they want to know what it's about, or to catch it. Right. I mean, no doubt the most assiduous watchers of Fox News are the Daily Show writers. Right, right, right. Well, it's, it's also for somebody like, um, I'll give you the example of like uh, an Olbermann. Uh, there is um, 
there was a study by one of my doctoral students who's at Minnesota now, Heather Lamar, talking about the differential reactions of liberals to conservatives to Colbert. That what she found was this study, and so she was on Oberman, because this it completely was a gotcha moment for Oberman, was that when he, when Oberman was first on, he was one of the first guests on the Colbert report, and he said, you better watch it. Like, you're putting up this front, and the conservatives are going to believe you. Right? And that's exactly what Heather found. Was that <laughs> the, the liberals and conservatives found Colbert equally funny. But the liberals found it funny because of how it was satirizing the right. Whereas the right was like, yes, it's all about the flag, and yes, and I believe those, and that's funny for very different reasons. And so once he got this story, he's like, oh, that's exactly what I told Stuart. Heather, and Heather was on twice. I'm over it for that because he's just like, yeah, I got you. I see, I'm right. You know, and something like that. So they do a lot of that. It's a lot of ego. Research. Yeah. In terms of context, I wonder if there are differences too in terms of how people access. Like, my access to Bill O'Reilly is mostly like, he said what? And then I go on to yeah. the Huffington Post right. and I watch the clip of that thing. Right, right. And I wonder, particularly maybe for younger audiences or your your cell phone respondents rather right. than your landline respondents, if that kind of abstraction from the broader show or that decontextualization right. of a particular point would have any effect on someone or what you would expect to find given that difference in how people view. There is clearly a form effect in the sense of even beyond the different types of outlets like the Huffington Post or George Report or wherever where you access clips of these mm -hmm. where they're previously constructed and arranged for you in a certain way. Exactly. There's also well and there's also many tools that exist on the web in terms of you getting access to about what's who's saying what about these issues or whatever from regardless of size. And so actually the the core relationship between liberal like web outlets and conservative web outlets via the, in the web obviously um, is much higher than on television. All right, and so the nature, in terms of even reduced risk, if you're in there, you can click in, click out, you can go in and you go out. I had some access, I got some sensor, now I'm gone. All right, as well as, so there's clearly, potentially, with regard to the new media environment, that creates another mix, part of the mix here, in terms of looking at channel or looking at the long attacks. Clear moderator variable relative to much of what's going on, no question. And in terms of, yes, the nature of where they get it from, in terms of it's previously constructed from, like, Huffington, from Ariana Huffington, Huffington, or from Matt Drudge, or whatever else, and there's context that there's a source effect there relative to their presenting that must be important because I trust Huffington, or I trust Drudge, or whatever else, and that's all in the mix as well, relative to looking at persuasive influences. No question. Yeah, it's complex. That's why you can be in this game for 40 years, right? <laughs> you know, study, right? Yes? Um, Of, no idea. More cultural studies ish, but she's looking at satire and um, kind of most recently the rally, rally to restore okay. and that sort of thing. And um, and in particular, recently she presented on some findings that um, uh, uh, orientation towards being moderate um, as being related to the, the kind of satire in the Daily Show um, that reveals complicity, com well, complicitness with yes. um, sort of media. Uh, ownership and with corporate sponsorship and that sure. sort of thing, and sort of this uh, assertion of of a political ideology that is moderate by virtue of being complicit. And so I think it it there's something interesting that 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 said, and she found that satire it finds its the the perfect form for expression of that feeling is satire. Ah. So. Well, that's a good twist relative to what Rod Hart and some others have talked about in terms of the reason that The Daily Show is just bringing forth cynicism. And so I think that's the other side of the, the debate. So well, which ironically, she found it to be, she specifically referred to that as well, and she found it to be um, a kind of cynicism that breeds participation. Ah, so yes. It's, yes, exactly. Yes. No that data yeah. for that. It remains to be seen. Well, yeah. <laughs> she, I mean, she's, she was interviewing people at the rally and talking to them about and people saying things like, um, I have never been to a rally before because I've never been one for moderates. Um, which I think is a, it, it, it's a complicated and interesting well, set of we were, we, we, One of my doctoral students right now is looking at the concept of ambivalence, which would probably fit in there somewhere in the mix. And we talk about a lot of the predictors of actually looking at attitudes from the standpoint of ambivalence. Um, that what you get is kind of a democratic ideal. 
to some degree, that you get that flaming moderate. Right? That's what democracy desires, right? Is that flaming moderation. All right? It's just very difficult to get. All right? But that's actually kind of what's representative. And so part of what we have to do, reflection on the empirical side, part of side, would be actually to think about like political attitudes and political behaviors in a much more complex way. And I think people are starting to do that, but that gets messy. Okay. I've got to announce next week's talk, which is something of a Something of a connection. Stephen Duncan from NYU will talk about art of the impossible, the politics of utopian imagination and expression. <laughs> There's some kind of. It's going to be on the. It'll be on YouTube. It'll be on YouTube. Oh, so it'll, be on YouTube. it'll be on YouTube oh, right. as you will. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> All right. That's good. Thank, Thank you, you very much.